Welcome mama bears and papa bears to another amazing mama bear apologetics podcast. I am so excited to be able to have our current guest on because in reading her book, it was fantastic to see not only the research that was involved, we have done uh, a little bit of research and, and we're affirming this stuff in some of our mama bear apologetics guide to sexuality books, but this is such a needed topic for today because today I have got the amazing Molly DeFrank on our podcast who wrote this awesome but called digital detox. Now, if you have kiddos in your household, you know that they love being on these things. But unfortunately, these are starting to take over our lives and even our kids. And so this podcast, I want to give a bit of a conviction warning. Possibly the discussions on this video are going to motivate perhaps maybe some behaviors that have crept into your households. And that's a good thing. Because to be honest, God has given us our children to shepherd and steward. And so often social media, influencers on social media, YouTube, they are taking over our families and we need to take that back. So as one mama bear to another who was convicted by this book, I just challenge you to be able to be open to the Holy Spirit as we discuss this very important issue of social media and just technology's influence on the family life. So Molly, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Amy. I'm so glad to be here. So I, I just got to know, how did this subject come on your radar of just tech, technological detox and the need for it in the homes? How did that, how did that, you know, come to your interest? You know, I wish I could say it was more cerebral, like I had studied it and wisely thought this thing out and did all the research ahead of time. But I actually, it, it kind of stumbled into this thing because as a mom, I have six kids now. I'm a mom and foster mom. Um, I had five at the time and four years ago. I just noticed some behaviors in my kids that were stressing me out. Mm -hmm. They were after screen time, they were falling apart. Mm -hmm. And like many parents whose kids were born in like the 2010s, you know, the iPad came out in 2011. Um, I bought in to all that stuff. Yeah. I bought into the marketing that told me this is how you get ahead is you let your kids play all these things. You let them do all the apps and you're going to make little rocket scientists. Well, <laughs> right. over time, I kept getting these nudges. I'm like, okay, well then why are they turning into zombies? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, why are there sibling fights next level? What's going on? And so finally, one day I came home from running errands and one of my kids greeted me at the door, not with, hi, mommy, but with, can I play on your phone? And that was it for yeah. me. I'm like, I'm done. I'm over this. I'm over the behaviors. I'm over being treated like a vending machine of electronics. So I called my husband at work. I'm like, I think we just need to take all of it away. Let's just, mm. let's go. And he was, he was all about that. So we told him and they fell apart. We were like, guys, no technology until further notice. We love you so much. We're taking it all away. And it was like tears galore. Yeah. No. So, yeah. It was very, yeah. Oh man. That's awesome. Because my husband and I, we've had similar conversations and, and we noticed it much like you did is we noticed the shift in behavior. So for my older son, um, I've got 14, 12 and 10. So my 14 year old, we started, you know, doing a phone just gradually because he was getting into sports and we're of the mindset of, we want to gradually introduce something so that you learn to exercise self-control and that sort of thing, maturity. Uh, and we noticed he was becoming more reclusive and more negative. And even his conversation with his buddies on, on the the phones were just very, very negative and toxic. And my youngest, he was big into like watching the YouTube videos of people doing Minecraft videos and things. He loved them, but we noticed this shift in his behavior to where he was just so over the top and extra and these weird dramatic quirks. And finally, my husband was just watching him one day and he goes, you know what? He's acting like a YouTuber. And we realized, oh my goodness, the influence that this technology, and just like my kids, it was like when they would come to talk to us, it um, they didn't have phones, but it was, hey, can, is, is it my turn on the PlayStation? Is it my turn now? Can I have a turn on YouTube? And it's just like, oh my goodness, is that all we know how to say to each other? So yeah, we've yeah. seen it too. Well, and we're the, to be fair to our yeah. generation of parents, we're really the first generation of parents wading through technology like this. Yeah. I mistakenly thought, well, yeah, I played video games as a kid. Mm -hmm. I, you know, was on AOL as a kid on instant messenger. Like this right. is the same technology for the next generation, but it turns out. And in researching and writing the book, I have learned so much. It is completely different. Yeah. Um, these, these engineers, these brilliant minds in Silicon Valley have taken what they know about the brain and dopamine and how to yeah. keep 
keep people tapping and scrolling. They baked this into their games and apps. So we're not talking about Pac-Man. We're not talking about Super Mario Brothers of our day or Saturday right. morning cartoons. We are talking about the same technology they use to keep people hooked in casinos, mm-hmm. um, to create gam- gambling addicts. They're using that in our kids, quote, educational apps yeah. in these games in, in YouTube. And so um, parents, we don't need to wring our hands. We just need to, like you were saying, kind of wake up to this Um, Mm -hmm. roll up our sleeves rather than wring our hands and say, well, what are we going to do about it? Like the technology isn't the same as it was when we were kids. What are we going to do about it? How do we train our kids? Well, how do we give them the skills they need to navigate a digital world without moving off the grid completely? And thankfully I found through this thing, and I've been helping parents get through this thing and find that right balance in their home. Yeah. And that's, that's so key, right? Is balance. Cause sometimes we can just overcorrect to one extreme or the other. It's like, okay, we're, we're either going to be totally immersive in technology or like you joked in the book and we've joked about it in our home too, is, Oh, we're going Amish. You know what? None of it, but it's really, we have to learn that balance. We have to teach our kids balance too, because eventually they're going to leave our households or they're going to go over to a friend's house. And if they haven't learned the skills necessary to navigate technology in our own homes, they're not going to be able to do it outside of our home or in someone else's. Absolutely. And you know, a lot of parents who I help are really great parents of phenomenal kids. They're just feeling a little stuck, yeah. and especially in like a, a Christian or a church context. These are parents who are diligent mm-hmm. and they're trying to train up their kids well. And yet we have this kind of area, this rock that we haven't looked under of our digital use. And, and it's time to kind of pull up that rock and check out the bugs wiggling underneath it and just, you know, put everything in its right place. So, so that's the goal here of the detox. It's not to go full Amish, although mad respect for Amish people, right? (laughs) Major respect, but it is to simply find a way to get technology working for you rather than feeling like you and your kids are being enslaved to it. So, so that's the whole goal here. And, and the beautiful thing is God put you in charge of your kids. Mm -hmm. You are the shepherd of your kids while they're under your roof. So your plan, your long-term plan is going to look a little different from someone else's. And that's beautiful because you know, your kids better than anyone else. So what you're really doing is helping them develop digital wisdom, digital discernment, so that by the time ready to launch, kind of like you guys talk about that chew and spit method. I talk about in my book, the sorting and sifting through these technologies, what's good, what's a little too sticky. Um, those kinds of things are that what we parse out in the book and the skills I help parents develop so they can pass that on to their kids. Okay. So can you explain a little bit more about that? Cause we love using the roar method. So what is your technique that you've developed for social media or just a fo- technology in general? Yeah. So, so the, the whole concept here of digital detox is to, you're taking a two week timeout, a full break. Um, it's kind of like when you clean out a closet for spring cleaning, you don't usually just like pick one or two things at a time. You take it all out and then you just put back what serves you. And what most parents have found is that too much of it has creep, crept in over time. You know, ever mm-hmm. since yeah. these all, another birthday, another console, another device, another phone. And now all of those in-between moments that parents have historically used to influence and shape the home and our kids' hearts and minds, they're all taken up. They're all full of a device. If it's not a kid looking at one, it's us. So yeah. what we do is we take this two-week break, cold turkey. We put it all away. We're giving us and our kids that time back. Now, what you're giving your kids is, these opportunities to um, reawaken a love of real life. I was talking a little bit earlier about the dopamine, and -hmm. this is why it doesn't work to tweak minutes of screen time every day. Most parents who are listening, they've probably tried that. You guys, if you're listening, you probably set limits. You're probably like, yeah, we're doing one or two hours a day. It's less than my kids' friends are doing. We're still seeing the behaviors. We're Mm -hmm. still seeing no interest beyond the screen. Well, when you go cold turkey, you're resetting those dopamine levels. So now real life doesn't seem boring compared to the devices. Um, The research is actually showing that our kids' dopamine receptors in their brain are actually numbing out because the the amount, the quantity of dopamine that's getting released is so high Mm -hmm. that no wonder our kids are complaining of boredom when there's not a screen involved. There's a physiological change happening. So we're really giving our kids so much more than what we're taking away. We're giving them opportunities to get reacquainted with real life, um, to have that person to person connection. Um, And what's really interesting is we know this from a 
from kind of a believer's perspective that we are wired to connect with each other, we're yeah. wired to connect with God. Um, but you see the common graces in this, and there is so much secular research to support this. Um, there was one researcher I came across, she's a, a child psychiatrist, and she actually identified a new condition that she calls electronic screen syndrome. Mm -hmm. And essentially it's when our kids, they can't, if, tell me if this sounds familiar. If your kids are unable to control their moods, their attention, their excitement in a socially appropriate way, um, they could have this condition, electronic screen syndrome, and this can create or worsen ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, anxiety. So if your kids are irritable, depressed, um, age inappropriate tantrums, low frustration tolerance, this can all be a sign that they just have too much electronics mm -hmm. and it's kind of numbing them out and overstimulating them. So when you give them this break, um, you're giving them a fresh start and you'll be shocked. I get messages from parents all the time telling me, I am in shock. I heard this work for other people. I can't believe how quickly it's working for us. So anyway, give this a shot. It's cold turkey two weeks. And then the second half of the book, I guide parents through, okay, like you said, we don't necessarily want to go off the grid, mm -hmm. but how do we put it back in its right place? So there's a full guide for that as well. Oh, I, I love that so much because in a way it's eye opening because to some extent, we as parents can even cultivate this behavior in our kiddos. Um, that's one thing that is always surprising to our family is, you know, we've got rules in place uh, with social media and everything. If ever we're going out to, or, or dinners, meals, you know, obviously technology is not permitted, but that's one thing that we've, we've started to take notice. And even our kids take notice is you can't go to a restaurant anymore. If you, or if you do, it, when you go to a restaurant and you look at the other tables, you will be hard pressed to find a table where they're talking to each other. They're not. And if there's children at the table, very often it's like, it's like that scene in Wally -E where they all have the screens. I mean, even to these tiny little 18 month olds who are on their parents' phone and they're not, you know, it's not like how they tried to tell us parents like, oh, ABC mouse, you know, you're going to app your kid into being Albert Einstein. No, no, they're not. They're not on educational apps. They're usually just watching cartoons. And that's what they're doing. Unfortunately, is we are cultivating um, this need for constant entertainment and stimulation. So no wonder they're having meltdowns and breakdowns because again, they don't know how to entertain themselves. And there, there's immense, like you say, there's immense beauty in boredom because in boredom is where you get creative, but we're not even allowing our kids to unwind and unplug from that. And even just from a, a more of a, a scarier perspective, my, my mother-in-law, she's an ER nurse and she has had teenagers brought in on they and they had to put them um, on suicide watch because the parents just told them no for technology. They had no idea how to cope with life outside of social media or technology in and of itself to where they had complete emotional breakdowns and they had to go into the clinic for several days for observation. And I mean, if, if we're getting to that point as a society, that shows that there is this huge underlying, pro underlying problem of this over-dependence upon technology. Oh, absolutely. That is unfortunately all too common. I've heard similar stories from local ER doctors, friends that I have down there. Um, but you know, we're, we are living in a world where we're numbing our kids out instead yeah. of parenting them. We are entertaining our kids instead of parenting them. Yes, and amen. the stakes are way too high for us to do that. Um, so there's, there was actually a series recently in the wall street journal exposing this. They said that ER visits for 12 to 17 year old girls for eating disorders mm. doubled over the course of the COVID shutdowns. And they research it. They're like, what is causing this? And they saw it was two things. Number one, underlying mental health problems. And number two, it was exposure to these TikTok body image yeah. videos. And it's just the, the things that our kids are getting exposed, exposed to, it's, it's hard to overstate how important it is for parents to get a hold of this issue. Um, I also want to just throw this out there because it can, this topic can sound so doom and gloom, right. um, but just to encourage parents, you know, we see in the book of acts that God chose exactly when we would live and exactly where we would live. So we do not need to feel anxious about this. Mm -hmm. We just need to take a minute, take a breath and trust him that he has us shepherding our kids at this point in time. And we can do this thing. We are up for the task. So Absolutely. We, thankfully, there are incredible uses for technology. You know, we, we're having this conversation now, thanks to technology. It's just a matter of parsing that out for our kids. And I also really appreciate that you mentioned you have a 14 year old. Mm -hmm. um, this detox thing is going to look a little different for those older kids as than it will for your younger kids. So, you know, if you've got young kids, my oldest 
this biological child is in junior high this year. She's about to turn 13. Um, and when I detox all my kids, they were 10 and under. Mm. So digitally detoxing those kids looks different. Parents have more of a sort of strictly authoritative role at that point where we can yeah. say, guys, you know, like bedtime, go to bed. It's eight o'clock. Good night. Mm. And we don't put ourselves to bed eight o'clock. But with those older kids, if you're talking about tweens, 14 year olds, you don't really get to say, okay, you're doing this detox and then kind of be scrolling on your phone. So so these um, these conversations with our tweens and our teens are really important. And, and all of that to say, this whole conversation needs to happen on the bedrock of relationship, of yes. parent-child relationship. So if we're trying to implement these rules on our kids um, without that foundation, it's the detox is going to crash and burn. But mm-hmm. when I'm, what I really encourage you to do in the book too is just amp up those opportunities for connection. And it doesn't have to be complicated. Honestly, one of my favorite parenting tools is a walk around the block, 10 minutes one-on-one with your kid and listen Mm -hmm. and maybe chat, but listen and don't bring any devices. Um, the dinner table, the car rides without devices. So, so all of this is, it's so basic and simple. It's really Mm -hmm. just taking away all the technology and increasing the opportunities to connect with your kids. And you'll be amazed at the transformation. Yeah. So with, and it's so very true, especially with my 14 year old, when we took the phone away, it was, it was almost instantaneous. Like the very next day he was more engaged with us. He was happy and smiling and chit-chatting. And it's just because, especially if you've, you've ever seen anything like social dilemma or understand any of the statistics behind kids use in um, social media, it is often very negative based. It's either comparisons with young girls or with guys. It's usually trash talking. And again, you have that separation, that screen separation to where the other person doesn't seem like a human being because they're just communicating with the screen. So they're often more negative. And once we pulled that away, oh my gosh, the difference my husband and I looked at each other, we're like, we've got our kid back. This is awesome. And so I love your encouragement uh, of parents. We, we need to step up and be parents, unfortunately. And, and I, I think there are times in which like motherhood in a way has almost been sort of vilified or just painted in a way that makes it seem like you can't survive it. I mean, look at all commercials involving a family. It's always the kids running amok, destroying the house and the parents looking like they haven't had sleep in three days. And I'm sorry, that's not a realistic depiction of parenthood. However, so often that's how it's marketed and moms, you know, it's, oh, you're your mother, you've got all this stuff to overcome. And yes, there is lots of things we have to do, but it, there's immense joy too. And so it's very important important for us to embrace our role as mothers and to be able to stand firm and and take back our family in this. So all of that to say, parents, don't be afraid to be parents. Don't be afraid to tell your kids no, because so often it's within your book too. There are stories of kids who came back later and said, oh my gosh, thank you. You, you saved me. You brought me back. I didn't realize how badly I was spiraling and how badly I needed someone to pull me out of it until it was. And it was, it's freeing. Well, and I so appreciate you saying that because parents, we are living in a culture where the world is saying, you know, everyone else knows better than parents. But what God's word tells us is that we are the original influencers Mm -hmm. of our kids. We are the shepherds of our kids. And we actually, this is such a privilege that it used to be that when our kids came home from school, home is a haven. Home was a place where they get away from, you know, whether it's bullying or negative talk or stress or drama. And now when kids are connected to these devices, there is no break for them. There's no haven. So, you know, there's even um, research to support this. Secular research shows us that teens who spend more time on screens are more likely to be unhappy. And teens who spend more time off the screen are more likely to be happy. There's not a single exception to this. This is out of San Diego State, the psychologist. It's, I mean, it's, there's research supporting it. We see it in our kids. Um, So it's really just time for us to kind of do the thing that we already know we need to do. Um, And I just want to encourage you as parents, if you're feeling kind of stressed because your kids don't, the desire isn't there for them to put the device down. Sometimes we got to be that the bad guy here and step in between them and the device and say, we're taking a break and I love you. And it's not a punishment, (laughs) but we're going to do this thing as a family and it's going to be really great. Um, And I just want to encourage you that you get so you get back so much more. You're giving your kids so much more than what you're taking away. Absolutely. And I love your encouragement for older kiddos to, to, to embrace it as well. So like if you, especially cause teenagers, right. They will pick up hypocrisy so quickly to where it's like, Hey buddy, I'm not just having you do it. 
I'm going to do it too. I mean, we're, we're taught in the military, you lead by example. And so, you know what, if you can lead by example, if you can even come alongside your teenager on like day five and being like, oh my gosh, you know, I stood there and I tried, you know, swiping my car keys today. What about you? You know, just saying, okay, I'm having to go through this too. It's great for teens to know that mom and dad are maybe going through some of the same struggles they are with technology and are see their children as worth it enough to go through it with them. I think it's so important. So Molly, I got to ask, we will get the 14 day detox. Um, what are some practical tips for once those 14 days are up? What are, what are some things that you found with other families that really help the success continue past the 14 days? Yes. Um, great question. So number one is putting technology in its right place. Like I mentioned. So sometimes that means physically, um, like for example, the devices I say, especially for our, for our younger kids, if a device connects to Wi-Fi, phone, iPad, um, computer, it should not be in our kids' rooms. Mm -hmm. Um, we are just handing over access to everything under the sun. Um, the, we actually see, you know, pornography is so accessible to our young kids. Um, one third of kids have seen porn by age 12. Mm -hmm. Um, this is not happening out there. This is happening. If you give your kids access to device with Wi-Fi, this is what you're handing over to them. So keeping the devices in a good place physically. Um, if a, uh, you know, the family computer in the kitchen, um, is a great place for that. Also, um, in its right place could mean on specific days. So in our home, we went from one to two hours of interactive screen time a day for our kids before our detox afterwards. Um, we don't do any interactive digital entertainment during the week. During the school year, it's only one hour on the weekends. Mm. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. one is the opportunity cost. By the time a school and um, extracurriculars are over and we have family meals and chores and all that, these kids really only have like maybe one or two hours of free time in the day. Yeah. Do we really want them using 100% of their free time on being digitally entertained? Probably mm. not. So anyway, I just encourage you to put it in its right place, whether that's a day or a physical location. Um, also... Um, I really recommend there was a trend for a long time, right? When these smartphones came out to give our kids phones early as yes. early as possible, yes. I, we need to stop that. And I really mm -hmm. see the, the tide turning. I think as we've watched a generation of kids, we've watched what happens when you give them a device as an appendage, we see that mental health has for our youth has reached just a, this terrible, terrible situation. Um, that same researcher I cited earlier, that psychologist out of San Diego state was studying the generations of kids. And she said, it's like a, a tsunami. Something wow. happened in 2011 or so 2010. And she was parsing out the data. She found it was the, the first point in time at which yeah. the majority of people had a device in their pocket that connected to Wi-Fi. Or we're so disconnected. So anyway, mm -hmm. I recommend do not get your kids a smartphone, wait longer, start mm -hmm. later. Um, I recommend that for your kids who do have smartphones, older, older teenagers. Um, I think it, it's, it's a good idea to give your kids access to that stuff. Once they're, you know, 17, 18, they can practice making mistakes under your, you can hash that out together, but you can control access at the router. So, um, yeah, there, there are so many ways you can do this again, just to, to bring this back. All of this needs to happen on the bedrock of relationship with our kids, because what we do, um, our relationship, our, our mentorship with our kids is so much more powerful than our rules. So yeah. it, we're kind of taking this concurrent approach here um, and having good conversations with our kids where we're not freaking out. Mm -hmm. You know, if they come and share something with you that they saw online or that their friends told them about or their friends showed them, um, I think the best piece of parenting advice I got for older kids was from my friend, Andrea. She said, never freak out. Never when your out. kids Amen. tell you something, if you need to go in the other room and take a breath and compose yourself, <laughs> <Right>. do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. When your kids are dipping their toe in the water. So, so let them like kind of process that with you. If you freak out, you're, they're not going to share that with you. So, right. um, you know, there's that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, uh, for f parents that maybe they have a little bit younger kids, maybe the phone has to be there, whether it's because, um, you know, there's distant family members, uh, it's a divorced family and they're needing to maintain contact. Uh, are you familiar with this thing called a gab phone? Yes. My oldest actually has a gab phone. So I really highly recommend non-smartphones for your kids. Um, there does come a point at which it is convenient for our kids to have phone. It's, this is a great use of technology. I, one of my kids, um, through a very 
whatever. It was a mix up at school with an extracurricular and catching a bus. And we couldn't find her for like 30 minutes and she didn't have a phone. So shortly after that, we're like, okay, okay you need we a need phone. Yeah. It is time. So anyway, she has a gab phone. It has served our family very well. Um, and this is, I mean, it's a phone. It's They can call, they can text, they can stay in contact with their friends. So mm-hmm. that, that is technology serving us really well. I, I totally recommend that. Um, it's been a great, there are, there are other options too. I think there's one called the light phone. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there are a lot of ways that we can help our kids to stay connected with us, with their friends, without also handing over access to the entire world and to lots of addictive technology. Yeah, no. And that's such a good point because yeah, if you've ever seen the social dilemma, I believe it's still on Netflix. It really shows that, yeah, they, they purposely designed these apps and things to be addictive for all. And what's so, what I thought was so telling were all of these designers who were involved in the initial launches of Facebook, Instagram, all of these things, they all, they all said the same thing. I would never give my kid one of these phones. I would never let them get on social media. And I think that right there is like, okay, if you have the creators saying they don't want their own families messing around maybe that's a little eye opening. Absolutely. And that was one of the things that blew me away during the research Mm -hmm. is, wow, I assumed that these tech experts were giving their kids all of this technology, but no, you're right. They're the strictest parents when it comes to their own kids. And so we have to ask ourselves if it's not good for their kids, why is it good for ours? And we realize as a generation of parents, we've sort of bought into the marketing rather than the truth and the facts. Yeah. Oh, I know. And it is because you do, you see these amazing apps and little fun games. Uh, There were a a few favorite ones of my kids when they were little that very, every now and then we would occasionally let them, uh, let them play on them, but for short amounts of time, but it's like, man, it's, it's so easily a slippery slope. So I'm loving all this encouragement to help parents take back their role as parents. Like, don't be afraid to let your kids be bored. Like I'm bored is awesome. You could say, well, like as our parents did, right. It's like, well, you can go play outside or I've got some chores you could do, man, they're going to be building forts. They're going to be raking the yard. I mean, it is awesome. Let them be bored. And then two, pour back into your kiddos. I remember when mine uh, were real teeny tiny and you take them around the grocery store. And in fact, this was even made in one of those commercials where you see this mom, this lady, and she's walking around going, it's a circle to an orange and where is the yellow and everyone's looking at her like she's deranged and it's because she's talking to a toddler and it's like we need to bring that back nowadays whenever I go into the the grocery store I don't see people doing that with their babies anymore and it's no mamas put the phone in the purse take your babies you know teach them pour into them they love you and they they need you and so I I love this book Um, Molly you also do some counseling uh, I believe on your website as well can you tell us a little bit about all the services the book Books, that sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I love helping parents through this issue. Um, so if you need help, please reach out to me. I, I tried to put everything in the book. I wrote the book I wish that I had before yes. we started our detox. Basically, I made all Us these too. mistakes. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> but I, you know, I, I stumbled through this thing and then I started helping friends and then I started, mm-hmm. people started connecting me with their friends who needed help. And so strangers online now I've been helping and, and the transformation is, it's so encouraging to see. So, um, if you need help, I wrote the book, it will help you through it. I promise you. And there's a bunch of freebies I I made for you too. If you get the book, you can go to my website, mollydefrank.com. Um, I made tech free dinner table topics. There's 14 of them, one for each night of your detox, how to convince a skeptical spouse. Sometimes one parent wants to do this thing and the other parents like, no, thank you. So, um, I also have, I tried to make this very practical. So yeah, like you said, single parents, um, working from home parents, um, multi-generational homes. There are a lot of speed bumps along the way. Um, mm-hmm. Parents with only one child, they'll think, well, your kids can play with each other. What's mm-hmm. my kid supposed to do? So I have a lot of problem solving solutions in the book for, for situations. Anyone can do this. I promise you it's way simpler than you think. Mm-hmm. And, and the stakes are so high that our kids really just need us to step in and kind of do this thing. Um, you know, their, their prefrontal cortexes are not fully developed yet. It takes nope. into their twenties before they can, that part of their brain that helps them learn to delay gratification mm-hmm. and make wise decisions. It's not formed yet. So they need us. They need us to step in and do the hard thing. And don't be surprised. I mean, the same kids that I broke the news to my own kids, when I told them we're detoxing them, mm-hmm. they fell apart. There were so many tears. A couple months later, they came back and unpromptedly said, thank you for taking our screens away. Which wow. blew my mind. I couldn't believe yeah. it. So anyway, don't be shocked when you see the same thing in your home too. 
That's awesome. You just, yes, absolutely. You just got to be brave enough to take those first steps. You know, if the tantrums ensue, that's okay. It's part of the grieving process. It's totally worth it in the end to be able to take back your kiddos, take back your family, have wonderful conversation and experience with your kiddos and, and just to teach them self-control. I mean, that is one of the uh, fruits of the spirit that is sorely lacking in society today. So thank you so much, Molly, for this uh, this work that you're doing, for these great encouragements to the parents. Parents, we challenge you all to take, take a hard look at who has a big influence in their lives because we've done research within Mama Bear. Up until the age of 19, parents, you are number one influence in your kids' lives. Please take that role. Take it seriously. And if you need help, reach out to Molly frank.com check out digital detox highly recommend it seriously it's eye-opening read this book uh, and share with us at mama bear how this is going in your lives this would be awesome for us parents to come together and be like okay here we go we got our 14-day detox we're going to be doing it in in our house uh as well so it's going to be fun so join us in doing this and again molly thank you so much for being here absolutely thanks for having me amy Absolutely. And yet, like I said, check out mollydefrank.com if you've got more questions on digital detox. It's fantastic. Mamas and Papa Bears, thank you so much for joining to, uh, me today on the podcast. We've got so many more great podcasts coming out. I'm not sure when this one's coming out, but gosh, if you're just joining in, we've got um, Frank Turek. We got Monique Dusan. Um, we have just got so many great ladies. We've got Katie Faust, Stacey Manning. We've got an amazing lineup for you this school year. So check us out at mamabearapologetics.com.